Waiting for mortgage rates to drop could be a costly mistake. Once rates drop, new home buyers will enter the market and prices will soar even higher. At Churchill Mortgage, you can get a free analysis and learn how to avoid the trap of waiting for interest rates to drop. Buy now and refi later at churchillmortgage.com. This is a paid advertisement. NMLS ID 1591, NMLS Consumer Access.org, Equal Housing Lender, 1749 Mallory Lane, Suite 100, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. Hello, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. Great to have your company once again. And coming up on this particular episode, we're going to talk about an exoplanet that has unusual rain. It's raining gemstones and ruby slippers. Well, maybe not the ruby slippers, but definitely gemstones, which is uh, very unusual. We're going to do a James Webb Space tele- uh, Telescope update, which is uh, you know something new for us. And a quadruple asteroid system has been discovered by uh, a group of people in Thailand. So that that's fascinating. Uh, we'll also be answering some audience questions. Bob wants to talk about research papers and how accurate or otherwise they might be. Al is asking a question about a black hole becoming a singularity and is that possible because he doesn't think so. And Steve is asking questions about photons and black holes. We're starting to leak back towards the black hole phenomenon, uh, starting to dominate again. That's all to come on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. My name is Andrew Dunkley. I am your host. Thank you for joining us and with us again this week because we can't get rid of him really. Uh, it is prof- <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Well, hello, Andrew. How are you? <laughs> You are the Space Nuts Barnacle, you are? that's Yeah, I yeah, know, just, just a barnacle on the backside of Space Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, dear. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> it was right. ever thus. It was ever thus. Yeah. I've been a barnacle. In fact, I'm probably still a barnacle on the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources as well. <laughs> they can't get rid of me either. <laughs> yeah, that, well, you know, why would they want to, Fred? <laughs> oh, thank honest? you, Andrew. Why that's a nice, that's a nice comment, yes. <laughs> right, we've got a lot to talk about today, so let's get straight to our first topic. And this is uh, a really interesting one. Uh, we've talked about uh, exoplanets and uh, and even planets and moons in our own solar system that have unusual kinds of rain like sulfur rain and acid rain, and uh, I think we talked about a planet once that rained diamonds. Uh, now there's an exoplanet that rains gemstones. What's uh, what's this all about? <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, it's gemstones among other things, um, and it, it's uh, you know the, the, there's a there's a lot going on on this uh, exoplanet. Uh, it's uh, what is it? Well, it is. Uh, I think it's a wasp. Yeah, wasp one two one b. Wasp is a is a, a project that um, that develop that, that detects exoplanets by the transit method, the fact that their brightness drops when they pass in front of their parent star. Um, WASP one two one is actually a star which is about eight hundred and fifty light years from here. Um, it has a planet which is uh, very close to it. It's a hot Jupiter. That's the <clears throat> excuse me the official description because it's a big planet. Um, and it orbits its parent star once every 30 hours. So, you know, its year is 30 hours long, Andrew. It just makes us believe, doesn't it? But that's what's happening. Um, now, that means, one of the things that means is that uh, w- with, a, you know, with a period that short and the distance between the parent star and the planet that, that small, this planet will be tidally locked to its parent star. And that is the, I guess, the key to understanding what's, um, you know, what's going on here. It is, uh, it, its day side, always it is, it's permanently facing the parent star. Well, that, that's a <laughs> bit of a tautology, really, isn't it? Uh, because the day side is always facing the parent star. <laughs> but the bottom line is, uh, geez, this is a good start this morning. You're going the, bo- well, Fred. The, the, the bottom good. line. See how is, I bailed you out of that. Yes. Oh, well done. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> the, 
the, uh, the, the planet is rotating at the same rate at which it revolves around its star, like the moon is rotating at the same rate as it revolves around the Earth. And so uh, you've got this one side of it that permanently faces the heat source. Hmm. And that means one side is hot and the other side is cold. Um, now, given that we can't see these planets directly, you may well ask, Andrew, how can you study the day and night sides of a world like this in detail? That's a good question. Glad I thought of it. I, I, I'm glad you thought of it too. The uh, and the answer is it's really clever stuff and needs, um, you know, it needs really quite significant astronomical infrastructure uh, in order to make these observations. I should exp I should mention that um, uh, the authors of this uh, work come from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Johns Hopkins. Oh God, Johns Hopkins University, Caltech, and other U.S. universities. It, it is a mouthful, but it is Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is what I tried to say. That's right. <laughs> I didn't really. Anyway, never mind. I didn't do well with it. But so, what? What? Um, how do you? How do you detect um, what's going on on the day and night sides of a world like this? And what you do is you observe the planet and well, you're, all you can see is the star that's the only thing that is visible in your telescope yeah uh, but you observe the star's light throughout the orbital period of the planet and given that that's only 30 hours you don't have to wait very long uh, if you were looking from outside the solar system and trying to do this with jupiter you'd be waiting what is it 12 years or something like that it's much mm. longer um uh no i think it's five years sorry i should do that calculation again uh, anyway, um, thirty hours gives you time to um, you know to, to actually work out uh, uh, exactly what's going on through the different phases of the planet because that's what it's all about. It's like the phases of the moon. We watch the moon going round uh, because it's lit up by the sun, and we can see you know the, it progressing from new moon to first quarter to full moon and all the rest of it. And yeah. you can do the same thing with an exoplanet but you, what you do what all you're able to measure is the total light from the planet plus the star mm. but as you'd imagine that varies throughout the the uh, revolution period of the planet um when you when you've got just when when the planet is behind the star all you've got is the light of the star uh, and i should add that you you you're not just observing how bright it is you're also observing the spectrum of this thing so you're looking in detail at the chemical constituents that is uh, is revealed by the light that is coming to you. Yeah. Uh, so when it, when the planet's behind the star, all you're seeing is the light of the star. When the planet shifts slightly uh, in its path around the star, so you can see both, what you've got is effectively you're looking at the full planet, like an equivalent of a full moon. It's almost completely illuminated. Right. And that light adds to the light of the star. Uh, and so um, you can then look at how the spectrum has changed, and that is telling you about the atmosphere of the planet itself, rather than uh, the, the you know the um, the atmosphere of the star. You, in fact, what you can do is subtract the star spectrum from the spectrum of the combined planet plus star, and you get the planet spectrum. Uh, that's that's how this works, and then that changes throughout the throughout the planet's year, thirty day, uh, thirty hours. Um, and, and eventually, you're looking at the backside of the planet, and, and in fact, uh, you you have a point where that is superimposed on the star. Once again, you can uh, you can do some clever work because you can look at the the you can look at the combined spectrum of the of the the backside of the planet superimposed on the star itself. That combined spectrum, uh, if you subtract out the spectrum of the star itself. It, it shows you what chemical constituents, again, are in the atmosphere of the planet because the light of the star is passing through the atmosphere of the planet, round the edge of it, yep. uh, and coming back to Earth. So that, that's the technique. Mm. Uh, and what's been found is that this object is quite extraordinary. So it's got um, a day side that is extremely hot, more than 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, so uh, what that does is the uh, it's known that there is water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. Well, there's water vapor on the night side, but on the day side, 
uh, the water molecules are just torn apart mm. because of the high temperatures. Uh, so you've got uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms that are that are you, you know they're they're I I independent within the atmosphere, um, and then it, it turns out that because of the heat that generates high pressure in the day side, which causes winds that blow things around to the night side. Ah, <laughs> and on the night side, it's cool, cool enough, yeah, for these things to form back to water, um, and so you get water vapor. Falling, forming in the atmosphere of the of the dark side of the planet, um, that they estimate that these these winds are five kilometers per second. Ooh. So this is eleven thousand miles per hour. It's um it's a it's you know sixteen sixteen to seventeen thousand kilometers per per hour. Sounds like um, that's the same as it was in Sydney yesterday. Uh, yeah, we didn't get the wind, but we got the rain. <laughs> so sure we got the we got the water vapor. Huge, huge quantities of of rain. <laughs> oh gosh, bucket loads of it. Um, H two O suitably combined back into water vapor. Yes. Uh, so that that's what they get on the on the dark side of the of this um, Wasp one two one B. Um, but uh, there's but wait, there's more. Uh, because it's not just water uh, that's that's circulating like this. Um, they find that on the night side, um, the, the temperature is right to have quite, um, I, I guess the best word is exotic, cl or clouds of exotic materials. Mm -hmm. And iron is one of them. Uh, and a mineral, a, a mineral that actually is a constituent in gemstones. That's that's the point that you were making right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, that's, and, uh, that's that's the journalistic hook, isn't it? It, it is, absolutely. So, um, yes, to quote the physics.org uh, <coughs> report on this, on, <coughs> on the way around, exotic rain might be produced, such as liquid gems uh, from the corundum clouds. Wow. Uh, so, you know, li liquid rubies, that would be quite nice, actually. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, Really, quite, um, really, quite remarkable stuff. I should mention that these uh, these observations were made with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. It was one of the spectroscopic cameras on board the Hubble Telescope that were that was used, uh, and fantastic work. Uh, congratulations to the team and mm. to the journalists who are writing about this. I don't suppose they can <laughs> tell us exactly what kind of gemstones these might be, or gem gem blobs components. Yeah, uh, they're suggesting um, that it could be um, uh, maybe um, look. I had rubies in my mind, uh, and yeah, may maybe rubies and sapphires. That's wow. that's um, that's the possibility. Corundum yeah. apparently is a mineral that that you know goes towards these uh, these gemstones. So I wasn't far wrong with my ruby slippers analogy. No, no, it's a very nice one. That I like that very much. Mm. Yes, <laughs> interesting. All right, uh, that that's a fascinating discovery. And uh, if you want to read more about it, you um, should go to the phys dot org website. That's not f i double z. That's p h y s dot org website. It's a fabulous website if you uh, want to catch up on that and and many other. Um, stories. Now, while we're uh, still up in space talking uh, observations by telescopes, uh, there's, there's one called the James Webb Space Telescope that um, <laughs> popped up in the news recently. I uh, haven't heard much about it, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> they've been trying to um, sort of put it all together and get the, the parts all linked up and get that, um, that mirror all organised. They've been taking some test photographs. Uh, we talked about one last week with the, the star that came out in 18 images. Has there been any progress since then? Uh, there has, Andrew, yes. And it's part of the process of, you know, um, s harnessing this mirror from 18 segments uh, to a perfectly focused uh, single surface mirror making beautiful images of different op distant objects. So what we saw last week was uh, 18 images of a star in the constellation of Ursa Major in the Northern Hemisphere, um, which were completely randomly placed in the field of view of the camera. Uh, and that was great because all 18 were there so that the, the mirror segments were somewhere near where they ought to be. Mm. What they've done now is um, they've tidied that up so that you've got this lovely hexagonal pattern of these 18 images. Um, and doing that um, actually expedites the process of, first of all, focusing 
each of the segments uh, independently uh, to give you a perfectly sharp image. And that will still result in, uh, you know, this uh, d display of 18, uh, uh, 18 different images in a hexagon, uh, but that hexagon will kind of match the, the, sh the, the, pos the positions of the mirrors that have formed the image, if I can put it that way. Um, yeah. it's, it's just a ready way of identifying which star has come from which segment. Uh, when they've focused all the segments, you'll get perfect star images from each segment, and then the work will begin to bring them all together so that they make a single image. That's the final, the final stage of the process. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm looking at the image compared to last week's, and you can you can see the uh, the improvement in the alignment. They're really starting to yeah come together well. It, it's great. Um, the, the the process is called segment alignment, uh, and the final stage when they've got that right, and each dot is uh, each star is is focused, or the star from each segment is focused. Then they do what's called image stacking, which, uh, as its name implies, they they put all the 18 uh, image segments on top of one another to make a single image. Mm. Well, I, I know a bit about that. I haven't tried it, but uh, a few people I've been chatting with about astrophotography uh, of late have been telling me about some of the methodology that they oh, yeah. use and, and image stacking. <clears throat> image stacking. Some of them actually right. take, uh, rather than photos, they take um, videos of okay. the images and then they work that into a still picture Yep. Uh, using the data that they've built up. Um, there's some clever people out there. I'm, I'm not one of them, but... Uh, <laughs> well, you are. You're following in their footsteps. Oh, um, I'm trying to. <clears throat> some of it I, I find way out of my league, but yeah. uh, I'll catch but, up eventually. That technique, um, so what, what you do is you take a video, uh, which consists of many, many still frames. Mm -hmm. And this is mostly for observing planets, actually, I have to say. Um, and what's happening during that, period is the uh, we're not talking about the james webb now folks we're talking about backyard. andrew's backyard um but the 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 atmosphere um varies and you occasionally within that video there will be images where the what we call the seeing the the amount of turbulence is virtually zero so there's the perfect image yeah. essentially so what you can do is you extract the perfect images from your video, and then stack those together, and you get a, a, a you know, almost a, a what we call a diffraction limited image. And I might just add that that technique, which is called lucky imaging, was uh, invented by a friend of mine uh, by the name of Craig Mackay at the University of Cambridge. He did this on professional telescopes 20, 25 years ago, yeah. uh, and his lucky imaging process is now basically carried out by amateur astronomers because he can do it. Fabulous stuff. Fantastic. It's well named too because uh, it, it makes sense that if you take a series of stills, you know, within a few seconds, uh, you could have hundreds of images. And because um, that oh, 30 frames per second is about yeah. average these days, isn't it? Or That's something. right. Yeah. So you're going to have uh, thousands yeah. of images of which you, you can, you're going to get lucky. Yeah. In that regard, and, rather than taking, like, my camera takes five shots with a, with, with I've set it up to take five shots of a, a of a single press and yeah i could get lucky there too but probably not as lucky makes sense yeah it's good uh, and i should have known that you'd be connected to somebody who came up with the idea <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm afraid that's right <laughs> all right it's a small uh, this, world is the astronomy world that's that's the yes, answer to yes that. i imagine so <laughs> yeah uh, sorry yeah, small world talking about a very very big world big universe indeed. yes <laughs> This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and, of course, Professor Fred Watson. As you know, online security is all important these days. There are lots of people out there that are trying to swindle you out of your money and a lot of them use hacking as a way of doing that. And I've heard some real horror stories uh, even in the last couple of weeks about people who have uh, found uh, money disappearing from their bank accounts or their credit cards being used that they didn't know about. Uh, it's it's pretty rough stuff and it's it's not fair, but it's also a reality of the modern world. So how do you protect yourself? Well, you use a virtual private network like I do. Uh, NordVPN uh, is uh, probably the best in the business. It's certainly fast. It's certainly efficient. It's uh, 
uh, available all over the world. They have servers in uh, multiple countries and easy to access. And it gives you all sorts of benefits. For a start, if you are using your mobile device in a public Wi-Fi scenario, you are exposed unless you use a VPN. And NordVPN works on tablets, it works on smartphones, it works on laptops, it works on computers, it even works on smart TVs. So it gives you that great wall of protection. And look, they, they've got a lot of endorsements from, from major organisations around the world because they are so very good. The BBC, Forbes, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Wired, they all uh, point the finger at NordVPN as being the best in the business. It also comes with a 30-day mon money-back guarantee. So if you buy it and you don't like it, uh, you can say, no, sorry, this is not for me. And I, I do want to actually congratulate our sponsor, NordVPN, because they're about to turn 10 uh, in fact, 10 years is, uh, in, in uh, the, the um, uh, internet world is, is a great achievement. So congratulations to NordVPN for 10 years. You, you, you certainly are a success, success story if you've racked up a decade. Uh, now, uh, as a Space Nuts listener, of course, uh, there is a special deal for you and you can get it by logging on to nordvpn.com slash space nuts and check out the deal. In fact, uh, they're offering 72% off a two-year plan at the moment. And they're, um, they're going to be offering little presents to celebrate their 10th birthday. So uh, it's a great time to take advantage of this offer as a Space Nuts listener. So log on to nordvpn.com slash Space Nuts for your special deal uh, with NordVPN. You won't regret it. It is a great service and it is uh, certainly going to give you peace of mind when you're browsing. It also gives you the ability to get past those geo-blocking situations if you want to log onto a, uh, a website in another country that uh, has a, maybe an article you want to read or a TV show you want to watch or something like that, and they say, sorry, you're in the wrong geographic zone, um, VPN can get you around that. There are all sorts of benefits to having a virtual private network. So check it out today by going to nordvpn.com slash space nuts using the Space Nuts code for your special 72% off two-year deal as a Space Nuts listener with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, back to Space Nuts. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, uh, if you would like to do us a favour, that would be wonderful. Uh, you can send your checks to Fred Watson at... No, um, <laughs> Of course, if you do want to become a patron, you can do that, and that is, um, you know, putting a little bit of money into the into the kitty uh, to keep the podcast rolling, which you can do via our website. Now, that is totally optional, and uh, you know, thank you to those many many uh, patrons that do so through Patreon or Supercast. So that that's something that you can do, or you can make one-off donations through the buy us a cup of coffee button on our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Uh, or, or if you want to do um, something that's going to be cost-free and just uh, cost you, you know, a bit of time, write a review through whatever podcast platform you happen to use. So uh, that's very helpful as well. So those are some of the options uh, to help support the Space Nuts podcast, and we do appreciate anything anybody does to uh, keep us up and running. Uh, now, Fred, we have a uh, very interesting story out of Thailand, which I found most surprising. When you talk astronomy and research and discovery, you, d you don't generally default to Thailand. A beautiful country. I've visited it and uh, lovely, lovely people. They're some of the nicest people on the planet, to be honest. But um, a, a few researchers from the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand have announced this discovery. Now, this is sort of a new spin on an old discovery from what I've read. Well, yeah, that's right. It's an, a new discovery. Yeah, Thailand's actually uh, got quite an active astronomical community, Andrew. Um, I have uh, colleagues who've, uh, who, in fact, one in particular who, who, who works there and a number of others who have been there working. This is um, three researchers, uh, one from Thailand, two from France, uh, at the Université de Lyon, and the Université Sorbonne. <laughs> right <-o>. Yeah. <laughs> the Sorbonne. That's pretty good, Fred. In Paris, yeah. We aim to please. Um, anyway, what they've done is they've used the Very Large Telescope uh, in down there in Chile, 
which is, of course, operated by the European Southern Observatory and to which our Australian astronomers also have access by the because of the, um, the strategic partnership that was signed back in 2017. I've always got to plug that. Uh, and it's great. It, it's, uh, it's, it's excellent that we've, we've got that. Uh, it's amazing to think that that strategic partnership between Australia and the European Southern Observatory is now halfway through yeah. 2022. It's staggering how fast time flies by when you're having fun. Anyway, back to this asteroid. It is um, a, a well-known asteroid. It's uh, number 130. Electra was discovered back in 1873. Um, and it's, no, it's been known um, actually for almost 20 years uh, that it had, uh, well, at least one moon. That was discovered in 2003. Another one uh, uh, 11 years later in 2014. And now, da-da, um, an, another moon. Um, so this is, uh, it makes the asteroid a kind of quadruple object because it's a, an asteroid which is relatively large. It's uh, 260 kilometres across. It's a decent-sized object. Yeah. But it, it has... Three moons, so altogether it's a quadruple object having four. Uh, the, it, what staggers me about this, Andrew, is just the fact that you know th these uh, scientists have been able to observe these moons because they are a long way away. This mm. asteroid is actually in the in the outer region of the main asteroid belt, uh, so it's not a particularly close one. Um, it is something called a G-type. Uh, asteroid, and they're quite rare, in fact. They're, they're carbonaceous asteroids, uh, which are relatively common, but these are a, a, a particular subgroup of those, and it's about 5% of all asteroids are G-types. And, in fact, the most notable and the biggest is Ceres, the dwarf planet Ceres, which was yeah. the first asteroid to be found. So what I was going to say was what is staggering, given how far away this object is, Electra, is how small these moons are. Um, first moon is reckoned to be six kilometres across. Um, the second moon discovered is reckoned to be two kilometres across. And the third one, the one that's just been discovered, is actually 1.6 kilometres across, about a mile. It's uh, very, very small. And when you think something, you know, a mile across at that distance, the far edge of the asteroid belt, that is astonishing stuff. Mm, um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's really a, extremely good work. They've they've done a lot of clever image processing, but the the moon is definitely there. Uh, that so that actually one of the now I found a statistic which I thought was quite remarkable. Um, this little object, the new one, uh, is very close to Electra. It's it's oh, it's quite close uh, to the asteroid itself. And its brightness is 15,000 times less than the brightness of the asteroid. Wow. So you've got something, you know, it's the, old, um, it's the old comparison of trying to spot the, the cigarette end of the lighthouse keeper while he's on the platform next to the lighthouse. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's that sort of, you know, huge, huge difference in brightness. So they've done very, very well to tease out the, the light of this little moon uh, orbiting around asteroid Electra. And Space NAS does not endorse the, uh, smoking. Smoking. <laughs> no, it's it's a, it's a difficult. I, I tend not to use that. Um, I know. I was just uh, joking, be, but, but 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 it's hard to find a better. You know, it's a really good. That's a, a good, really good, good example. Analogy. Yeah. Um, Arthur, don't can, worry. I'll think of something. I'll think oh, of something. maybe a torch or. Or you could say um, is, is mobile phone. Mobile phone light. Yeah, yeah the mobile yeah. phone. That's but, no, I understand what you're saying. It makes sense. Yeah. Now, um, I. I just need to clarify something in my head because I get confused about this. When you say the asteroid belt, this is out beyond Mars? Yeah, between the main belt is between Mars and Jupiter. That's right. correct. So, okay. uh, And this is on the far edge of that. So it's, you know, its distance is quite really quite significant. Mm, because the other one's out around, you know, the, the, it includes Pluto, right? Yeah, that's right. And, that and will be the, you know, Kuiper um, the Kuiper belt or the yep. trans-Neptunian objects and all the different categories of objects that are out there. But, yeah, it is, it is a very distant asteroid belt. So um, the, the, I guess the three main regions where there are asteroids are, first of all, the main asteroid belt, and that is by far the most populous. And then the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. These are the mm. ones that orbit in Jupiter's orbit and in front of and behind Jupiter. 
and then uh, you know the trans-Neptunian objects, the objects way way out in the in the furthest reaches of the solar system. Yeah. So there's there's all these layers in the solar system that um, sort of live in little regions as yeah. you spiral yeah. out and yeah that's right um so we, we've kind of got a divide between the rocky planets and the gas giants haven't we yes that's right and um it, that, that's exactly right and it, it's and it, it's once again it's because jupiter is such a big planet um it's it's probably you know the main asteroid belt is is remnants of the formation of the solar system uh and They've kind of been steered there just by the gravitational influence of Jupiter. Mm. Um, it's probably more or less where they form, but uh, they're still there. Um, Jupiter's huge gravitational pull may well have inhibited the formation of another planet there. Yeah. Um, so we've still we've got this debris. It sort of reminds me of flat pack furniture, Fred. <laughs> Because um, yeah, the formation of the solar system and yeah. they've got all this leftover stuff. When you yeah. when you get flat pack furniture and you put it together, you go, "Hang on a minute, Where's what, that what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. <laughs> where does so this go?" Yeah, and when you when you realise where it should have gone, you, you're really <laughs> too far down the track to take it to bits. Yeah, ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. If we ever move, I'll fix it then. More yeah. or less, yes, that's right. Put it in the box mm, and right. forget about um, it. But yeah, what a great discovery and, uh, and and delightful to hear that there was involvement uh, in in Thailand because yeah, uh, I don't think too many people would realise that they've got a um, an astronomical uh, fraternity, if you like. Yeah. Mm. Yep. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's get into our question segment. This is where people who listen to Space Nuts send us all sorts of uh, hyper-intelligent questions that I've got no clue about, but Fred has an inkling. And uh, our first one comes from Bob. This is Bob from Asheville, North Carolina in the US. I have two questions. In 2005, Professor John Ioannidis published a highly influential paper in PLOS Medicine titled, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. He makes the argument, and here I'm quoting, that for most study designs and settings, it is more likely for a research claim to be false than true. It's important to note that he was focusing on medical studies, which have less scientific rigor than physics. He does, however, conclude that, and I'm quoting his paper again, that for many current scientific fields, claimed research findings may often be simply accurate measures of the prevailing bias. My first question for Professor Watson is, how often does this happen in your field? Meaning, how often are published research findings actually false because of bias or statistical reasons? My second question is a hypothetical. Medicine changes relatively quickly. For example, peptic ulcers were treated with surgery until 1984, which is when Barry James Marshall, an Australian physician at Royal Perth Hospital, reported that peptic ulcers were caused by a type of bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Today, ulcers are treated with antibiotics. Professor Watson, suppose you could fast forward 100 or 500 years into the future and look back at cosmology and astro. And that's where Bob unfortunately got cut off, but we think we've got the nuts and bolts of his question. (laughs) Uh, So we're going to take a a stab at it for you, Bob. Um, But, yeah, I guess the first part of his question is about um, uh, scientific papers, research papers, uh, published works, and uh, how maybe they could misinform or not be quite accurate? Is that something that happens? Um, look, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, there are, I don't think there in, in astronomy, um, there is a strong uh, incentive perhaps or, or um, reason why uh, people should intentionally misinform. Um, I think that is almost always almost always zero. Um, and what research that does bark up the wrong tree, what research of that kind that there is, is, is honest mistakes. Hmm. Um, like the colour of the universe, perhaps. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. That was an honest mistake, yeah, which was, um, <clears throat> what was it? It was kind of 
Some well, they sort of, originally said it was aqua, but it turned out yeah. to be beige. It was beige, yeah, that's right. And, and in fact, um, I remember when I read that paper, this is probably 10, 15 years ago, and I know the guy who wrote it quite well. Uh, I remember when I read that paper thinking, this cannot be the case. You can't have a, a an aqua universe because it's, mm. it's expanding and, you know, you've got basically a redshift there and it turned out to be beige which is <laughs> redshifted aqua anyway yeah. look um the kind of thing that i was thinking of andrew and it might go to the heart of bob's question is you remember last year there was a big fuss when people thought that phosphine had been detected yes. in the upper atmosphere of venus mm. um uh, and phosphine is on earth is is generally produced by biological processes uh, and so the, I know that the researchers who did that work, and I know some of them, in fact, I talked to one of them afterwards. Uh, he's a friend, friend of mine in Hawaii. Um, they were very, very careful to tease out the signal of phosphine from the noise. It was This was done with quite big radio telescopes. In fact, ALMA was one of them, uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was with reluctance that they mentioned the fact that it, phosphine's a, a live product. Um, because the popular press jumped all over that. Yeah, that's right. There's and, life on Venus. There's life on Venus. Yeah, that, exactly what happened. And, um, uh, you know, maybe the bias that Bob mentions is there because it's something that we're all, you know, we're all kind of trigger happy with. We, yeah. we are uh, urgently trying to seek uh, any evidence of life anywhere else in the universe. Mm. Um, now, and, um, and when, when you give some elements of the media an inch, they take a mile. That's, that's well, that's true, and that certainly happened in that case. Yeah. Um, my recollection is that the the original team still stand by their their discovery that it was phosphine, but there was another paper published. It must have been actually the year before last when the phosphine measurement was made, because I think it was early last year that another paper was published showing how the phosphine signature could be mistaken um, that it might actually, I think it was something like nitrous oxide. I can't remember. It was something a lot less um, suggestive of life processes. So mm. I think honest mistakes are made, but yes, there might be a bias there too. Uh, I, generally, I think you'll, you'll probably find bias in circumstances where somebody's trying to sell something. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you, you might get those, um, you know, studies that are released into certain uh, products that improve your life and the study turned out to be 10 people at a five-star resort for a weekend <laughs> answering a questionnaire, yes, yes, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's yeah. a bit of that goes on. There is, certainly. Uh, less so in astronomy. Astronomy, I think, is uh, partly um, what one thing you're looking for, and you always check this whenever you make a discovery, is how consistent it is with what we already know about the universe. Because um, often, you know, our discoveries, they're highly forensic. It's all done at distances ranging up to 13 billion light years. Um, just turning to, and I'm, I'm hypothesizing here as to what the second part of Bob's question was, because he got cut off, as you said. But uh, I think he might have been wanting to ask me what, if I fast forwarded 100 years into the future and then look back at 2022, what I would think of as being discoveries that maybe were misleading. And perhaps the one that comes to mind, and, and it's not through any lack of honesty, this is the best evidence we have so far is that dark matter exists and that it is a subatomic particle of some kind. That is, that is pointed to on so, by, through so many different experiments, and there's a self-consistency about it as well with what else we know about the universe. Yep. But um, it could well be that it turns out that it wasn't that. Um, you know, that in the end, there is something that we don't understand about physics. And what I'm thinking of is MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. We've got a, a friend out there in the audience, Peter Verweyen, who's studying that for his PhD and doing a great job. You know, just maybe uh, the tide will turn and people will see the evidence for modified Newtonian dynamics, which means that gravity doesn't behave quite the way we thought it did on large scales, um, that that might turn out to be the answer. That would be one I might venture to suggest would be something that in 100 years' time we might look back on and say, <laughs> we all thought it was dark matter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how foolish were we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and, and that's not 
probably not an uncommon scenario. I mean, we we hindsight is twenty twenty, and yes, that's right. You don't have that's... hindsight until you go forward and look back and go, ah, oh, okay, all right, we yeah, that was it. That was why. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Of course, we get it right a lot of the time too. I, I think point. we do. I think yes. that's right. All right, Bob, lovely to hear from you. Thanks for your question. Let's move on to our next question from Al. G'day, this is Al on the Sunshine Coast. G'day, Fred and Andrew. Given that the centre of a black hole is almost infinitely dense and mass slows time, surely a black hole cannot have had time to reach a singularity. The universe is not old enough. Thanks for the best podcast on the net. All right. Thanks, Al. And <laughs> thanks for the endorsement. That's lovely. Um, I thought it was the best one in the universe. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, interesting question. A black hole can't reach a point of singularity. What, ha, have, has anyone ever hypothesised that that could be the case? Uh, um, no, no um, because uh, time dilation is a phenomenon that depends on the the reference frame that you're in, Andrew, um, it's it's like, um, you know, I mean, this is gravitational time dilation. Um, so we on Earth s see our clocks ticking at a normal rate, whereas we know that actually relative to what's going on outside, they're slightly slow because of the gravitational pull. But it's that relativity between the two. Mm. So the, the, the black hole itself just sees time progressing normally. It's only... To an outside observer, that you see it highly dilated because of the gravitational pull. So, yeah, it probably does have time to con contract to a singularity. Aha! Uh -huh. There you go. Now, a short, sweet answer. Sometimes they're they're, they're simple, um, but yeah, interesting thought on your part, no doubt about that. Uh, and we're going to uh, squeeze in one more question today, and that comes from Steve. Hi, Fred and Andrew. Uh, this is Steve from Sydney. Um, first off, thank you for your amazing podcast. I look forward to it every Thursday, so thanks again. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, if photons are massless particles, why are they affected by gravity? And secondly, um, and I apologise in advance because it's a black hole question, um, when a spinning star collapses to a black hole, um, how is angular momentum conserved? Um, you know, how is the spin given to a point with no dimension? And I guess a, 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 an intermediate question is, if, if the collapse takes a finite amount of time, then um, at some intermediate stage while it's collapsing, what happens to angular momentum? It would seem to me that as the star collapses and gets, you know, becomes um, smaller and smaller until it finally sort of um, it becomes a singularity that the speed would increase, um, and really I can't see why it just doesn't keep uh, the speed doesn't keep increasing until uh, it becomes infinite, which it obviously doesn't do. So I look forward to your explanation. Thanks once again. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for the question. That's a really good one. Uh, did you take notes, Fred? Because there was a lot. <laughs> to that. The the first part is um, about. Um, Photons being massless particles, they're massless in the sense that they don't have a rest mass because they can't be at rest. Uh -huh. um, and But the way to think of it, um, Steve, is uh, that photons will follow geodesics, and these are the pathways through space that effectively to the photon look like a straight line, but they're modified by gravity because gravity is the process of distortion of space. So if you've got a massive object and a photon whizzing by it, it co continues in a straight line, but that straight line is bent because the gravitational effect of the, uh, you know, of the of the massive object is to is to distort the space around it. Um, I don't know whether that sounds like a glib answer, but that's the bottom line. Uh, photons follow geodesics, which are basically as far as the photons concerned, are straight lines, uh, but it's the space itself that's being distorted by gravity. I get it. Yeah. Good. Uh, now, part two: <clears throat> uh, rotating black holes are definitely there. Um, they exist, but they're quite counterintuitive. 
for the exactly the reason that Steve says. You've got a, a point with no dimensions. How can it rotate? Mm. Um, and once again, <clears throat> there is actually a really good summary of the aspect of black holes. Uh, once again, on good old Wikipedia, if you check out rotating black hole, there is, uh, I think, a relatively digestible <laughs> um, uh, summary of what's going on there. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and and it comes so the, the Einstein field equations have solutions, um, you know, which which uh, one of which is is the one that Schwarzschild found, which is the, basically the black hole solution. Uh, but there are four stable black hole solutions, and two of them are rotating. Uh, the Kerr rotator is the one I know best, um, but there's another kind called the Kerr Newman black holes. Uh, and it comes about because these black holes uh, can be described by a small number of parameters. Uh, in fact, basically there are uh, five of them, uh, three of which have three components, so there are actually 11 altogether. Um, and this is something very close to my heart, Andrew. It's about something called the no-hair theorem, uh, which I actually wrote about, I think, in Cosmic Chronicles. Um, from personal experience. Yeah, personal experience, that's right. <laughs> uh, and it comes from uh, – let me see if I can find it, because it, it, was, it was quite entertaining stuff. Um, Don't forget you're wearing headphones. I know, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> can I reach the book with my headphones I want headphones to drag on? everything off the desk. Uh, that's the wrong book. Yeah, this, I did this last week much more yeah. effectively, I must well, say. No, something there you go, out. something went. Right. Yeah, it's nothing breakable. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether I'd even be able to find this. Um, but it, 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 it's, it, it comes from, um, uh, you know, it, it comes from the early days. Uh, the no-hair theorem comes from the early days of of research on, on black holes. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember being highly amused by uh, by the idea of the no hair theorem, I can't find it, Andrew. That's a bit uh, that, sad, isn't all it? All that build up, Fred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, where did I write about it? Um, it uh, it was it was the oh here we are oh here we are one of my favorite. Oh, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to read from the book. Uh, da, 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 da. Everybody loves black holes, from kindergarten kids to professors of theoretical physics, but until the image uh, a couple of years ago was produced, much of our knowledge was founded on mathematical theorems developed to describe their expected properties. Now we've had first-hand evidence that these theorems work. That was the, the photograph, the famous uh, photo of the black hole. One yeah. of my favourites among them is something with the curious name of the no-hair theorem. And it says that from the outside, the only observable properties of a black hole are its mass, its electrical charge, and its angular momentum or spin energy. All there its other are. characteristics are hidden behind the veil of the event horizon. Um, I might just keep going for a minute, Andrew. The boundary, oh. that of course, the boundary beyond which no radiation can escape. In other words, the black bit. The term, uh, the term uh, no hair theorem was coined around 1970 by the American theoretical physicist John Wheeler, who commented that black holes have no hair, meaning that all information other than that mentioned above is inaccessible to outside observers. Um, Wheeler actually attributed the term to his student, uh, Jacob, oh, Jakob Beckenstein, who worked with him at Princeton University. Did da did da. It goes on from there, but mm -hmm. basically, it's a it's a you know the, the the angular momentum is just one of the parameters. Uh, that describes a black hole, and it is non-zero. And you're quite right, or Steve's quite right, that you know if you've got a rotating uh, stellar core that is collapsing, then the angular momentum will be conserved, and it will basically the thing will start spinning ever faster. But the angular momentum itself will be part of the parameter list of the black hole, uh, and it's just perhaps uh, our inability to imagine. A, a single particle, a, a singularity, uh, a single point that has no dimensions to imagine that rotating, but it does yeah, because <laughs> it's got yeah. angular momentum. Mm. In, in terms of a black hole having no hair, have they checked the nostrils and the ears? Because they are quite old. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, look, uh, that's I'll, where it all goes. Yeah, I have this. I have this theory, Fred, that yeah. as as men particularly get older and their hair disappears off their head, it just comes out of here and here. It's, well, I, you know, I, yes, I know. I, I, I look. I'm far it's older just than you. Gravity. <laughs> yes. it's got, it's it could be gravity. Yeah. Yes. Well, gravity is certainly there. gravity is certainly what describes a, uh, what defines a black hole. So maybe mm. it is. Maybe there are nostrils and ears, and I'll. Consult my black hole specialist colleagues next time this, I this see could, them. This could open the door to some incredible answers. Yeah, the no nostril theory. Yeah. It's not a very good joke, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Bob, for your questions. Much appreciated. And don't forget, if you've got a question, jump on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and click on the Send Us Your Voice Message tab on the right-hand side or the AMA tab at the top where you can send us text questions via email or record audio questions. We've got two ways of recording audio questions. Uh, there's also other things you can do on our website. You can check out Astronomy Daily, which updates several times a day with astronomy stories. Uh, you, um, if, if you're interested in becoming a supporter of Space Nuts, there's options there for, uh, for advertising and membership, so check that out. Um, um, you can read all the reviews or you can just have a bit of a look around in the Space Nuts shop. It's all at spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. That brings us to the very end of another episode. Fred, thank you so much, as always. <laughs> Great pleasure, Andrew. Thank you. And we'll speak again next time. We will indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for joining us again. Great to have your company. Keep those cards and letters rolling in. <laughs> we love snail mail. We might get it in a couple of years. Uh, but until next week, bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.